Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of Unhallowed. I'm your host, Patrick McFarlane, joined by my wife, Lizzie. Hello, everyone. The boy is in bed, the boy (laughs) being our son. The boy. And the beer has been poured. We're ready. And we're ready for episode two, which is the first episode where we will be dissecting a piece of gothic horror. Arguably the first piece of gothic horror. Tonight we're going to be discussing the Castle of Otranto by Horace Wadpole. Wadpole. I always want to say Walpole. So this is one of the pieces that we deep dive dissected in my senior seminar. And one of the things that they focused strongly on was the feminism of the piece. While I do find there to be feminist aspects to this work, I have a perfect little snippet quote that I would say really shows and maybe some some little backup things. But I would say I've, I've got one quote that really just shows that this isn't that kind of thing and that as much as we like to look back and attach meanings to things, I don't think this is exactly what you would say is a feminist work. Sorry, just got to throw that out there. Uh, well, attach modern meetings to works that are hundreds of years old. I feel like that right. happens a lot. So a structure for this episode, I wanted to talk about Horace Wadpole and talk about what he did with the piece. Okay. And then see how far we get when it comes to actually analyzing. The actual story. Yeah. Okay. Then I guess I jumped the gun a little bit. But... Oh, naughty, naughty. <laughs> I just wanted to, I I mean, the class that I was in, and as much as I admire people, women, especially in the past, like the suffragettes in ways and, and, and other aspects of feminism, I would not say I am exactly a feminist. Don't come for me. I'm, I'm glad that you're confronting this and not me. <laughs> but I just, I, I don't want to... I mean, it was just such a focus on this this course that I took. We would bring up a work and it almost instantly delved into how this was a feminist work and how this showed the beginnings of feminist literature. And even though it was written by a man or it was written by a woman, it was it was feminism. And I suppose I just took that (laughs) and decided to like run with that. Like, no, Patrick, this isn't a feminist work. I, I don't know how you would think that someone who is a member of parliament, who is a member of the bougie class in England, would a male who would write a feminist work during this time. But just a little background, we recorded this episode about two weeks after we recorded episode zero and episode one. We learned a little bit of a lesson is that we need to make sure that we bite off bite-sized manageable chunks of works to prepare ourselves for the next week. Uh, because I would like to release episodes on a weekly basis for this show. I, on works like this, because The Castle of Otranto is a, a novella, would you say? Lizzie? I would say. I would say. Yeah. What we might end up doing is is laying the foundation background, because this is the first ever piece of gothic fiction, to lay a bit of a foundation in a first episode here, and then try to tackle the actual story and maybe a part two, and, and maybe even split that up into two parts we'll see we'll see how this episode goes to dive in and try not to bury the lead here horace wall walpole was the youngest son of sir robert walpole the great statesman who died earl of oxford and lizzie is a bit more uh familiar with british culture than i am and in because you're you're a bit of a anglophile a bit he was born in 1717 the year in which his father resigned office remaining in opposition for almost three years before his return to a long tenure of power. Horace Walpole was educated at Eton, where he formed a school friendship with Thomas Gray, 
who was but a few months older. In 1739, Gray was traveling companion with Walpole in France and Italy until they differed and parted, but the friendship was afterwards renewed and remained firm to the end. Differed and parted. I like that. That's a nice way of saying we had a falling out. Yeah, or I hate his guts. <laughs> <laughs> we differed and parted. Uh, Walpole went from Eton to King, King's College to King's College, comma, Cambridge, and entered Parliament in 1741, the year before his final resignation and acceptance of an earldom. His way of life, life was made easy to him as usher of the exchequer, comptroller of the pipe, and clerk of the estreats in the exchequer. What does that mean? I don't know. Okay. But I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. The exchequer is is like a, a part of the court. Okay. So like our Supreme Court, I don't know if it's uh, – I learned this in, in law school, but – we studied it a little bit. I just can't recall exactly. Um, so he received nearly 2000 a year for doing nothing, lived with his father, and amused himself. Horace Walpole idled and amused himself with the small life of the fashionable world to which he was proud of belonging, though he had a quick eye for its vanities. He had social wit and liked to put it to small uses, but he was not an empty idler, and there were seasons when he could become a sharp judge of himself. Quote, I am sensible, he wrote. To his most intimate friend, I am sensible of having more follies and weaknesses and fewer real good qualities than most men. I sometimes reflect on this, though. I always want to begin acting like a man and a sensible one, which I think I might be if I would. He had deep home affections and other many polite affectu affectations, plenty of good sense. So it sounds a little bit like he was a man-child. He was sent to be educated at a very prestigious Ivy League university. Mm. Two. Yeah, two of them. And I I don't know, he's maybe he's a bit of a millennial <laughs> in a certain way. I'm not sure, but I mean it's not like he was Arrested dumb. The development. And he seemed he seems like he I mean he ended up being a member of parliament. So, but this is from the the introduction to the Castle of Otranto. Okay. Uh that I bought off Kobo, which Who wrote the intro? I'm not sure actually. I, I'll put a link in the show notes page at unhallowedpodcast.com forward slash two because this is episode two. And if you want to support the show, you can purchase through the Amazon link if you are on Kindle or anything like that. Or you could buy a physical book version. <laughs> Who does that? I got a free version through my Kindle. Oh, so did you? I didn't even buy it. I don't want to read the whole introduction here, but... He, he produced the Castle of Otranto in 1765 at the mature age of 48 for the time. It was suggested by a dream from which he said he waked one morning and of which, quote, all I could recover was that I had thought myself in an ancient castle, a very natural dream for a head like mine filled with a gothic story, and that on the uppermost banister of a great staircase I saw a gigantic hand in armor. In the evening, I sat down and began to write without knowing in the least what I intended to say or relate. So began the tale which professed to be translated by William Marshall, gentleman, gentleman. from the Italian of Onfrono Muralto, canon of the Church of St. Nicholas at Otranto. It was written in two months. Walpole's friend Gray reported to him that at Cambridge the book made, quote, some of them cry a little. And all in general afraid to go to bed o' nights. <laughs> Lovely. When did so he was forty eight when he yep. wrote it? Yep. Yeah, for the time. In seventeen sixty five. What was the the life expectancy then? Yeah, probably like sixty, fi early sixties. Like Fifties, early sixties. Yeah. yeah. So he was not quite in his twilight years, but it's it's a it's a cool story. And when we were talking about it in episode what episode one, our last episode, mm. I, I I think I was a little harsh on it because I had kind of started. I haven't even I hadn't even started reading it then, and I incorrectly pronounced the name. Mm. <laughs> but it, it's a story that's very interesting because, in a way, and we had talked about this, is that it's kind of a found footage film, right? So I am a big fan of found footage. I did not watch or know what the found footage horror um, genre was until I was maybe 23, 24. So to me, I found it to be really just mind-blowing. Any anytime that something pops up and it's found footage, 
I just want to grab it and watch it. One of my favorites being As Above, So Below. Uh, that's one of my absolute favorite found footage movies and one of my favorite horror movies. I think it's very well done and kind of gets you in that place where it's uncanny. I, I think that's a very good example of an uncanny horror film because, and I'm not going to ruin it for anyone, but I'm just going to say that showing what's above what would be our reality and what's below, which would be a, maybe a reverse or a reflection of the reality in which we live. Highly recommend it. But I think that found footage in this how would you say, how would you lay it out that you would claim this to be found footage? Well, because Horace Walpole, when he initially publishes it, and I have another resource that I'm using and one that I'll put in the show notes page is the Cambridge Companion to Gothic Fiction. And it, it's a wonderful addition that I've used to kind of frame this. And the first chapter is actually mostly about Walpole and how he invented the genre. Mm. I'll, I'll read from it a little bit. So the first page, basically, gothic fiction is hardly gothic at all. It is an entirely post-medieval and even post-Renaissance phenomenon. Even though several long-standing literary forms can bind in its initial renderings from ancient prose and verse romances to Shakespearean tragedy and comedy, the first published work to call itself a gothic story was a counterfeit medieval tale published long after the Middle Ages. Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto, printed under a pseudonym in England in 1764 and reissued in 1765 with the second edition, with a new preface which openly advocated a, quote, blend of the two kinds of romance, the ancient and the modern. The former, quote, all imagination and improbability, and the latter governed by the, quote, rules of probability connected with common life. The vogue that Walpole began was imitated only sporadically over the next few decades, both in prose fiction and theatrical drama, but it exploded in the 1790s, the decade Walpole died, throughout the British Isles on the continent of Europe and briefly in the new United States, particularly for a female readership. <sighs> but um, my thought is that, well, he tried to pass this off as a story that he had somehow resurrected from the 1500s or he, perhaps it had been found even earlier quote found found it was there found footage it's based in italy yep and it was supposedly found in like a church something like is that, that is that what the is that what the okay so it was it was found in a church it's a medieval story set in italy it focuses on one family yep in their principality or their area that they have ownership of and the main characters would be uh, the father Manfred the mother Hippolyta is how I'm going to pronounce it the daughter Matilda the son Conrad and Isabella who is their ward who is also nobility one thing that they really touch on in this Cambridge piece too is this blending of Events that couldn't possibly take place and common reactions to those events that couldn't possibly take place. So it's events that are happening that are extraordinary, but people reacting the way that you would predict them to in a real life setting. So, And that's what he talked about when he published this story. It was actually an aim of his to do so. Okay, so an event that would not be able to happen would be the helmet. The helmet falling on Conrad at the beginning of the story. So in the very first, what, second paragraph, the Prince Conrad is going to marry Isabella. So Isabella has been brought up basically as his sister, but she's also nobility. And there's been a match made for Conrad to marry Isabella. As I said, in the first few moments of this story, an enormous black helmet with black and was it black plumes so yep. like feathers falls from the sky in the courtyard lands on conrad and like brutalizes him basically like blows him into pieces it's pretty badass yeah like we're i mean it just goes off for a few sentences about how this dude is just annihilated 
and his dad comes over and is just like, <laughs> like this is so gross. And then, but it's okay that that happens because Conrad was a sick, a sickly child. He was sickly, yeah, and he wasn't fit to carry on Manfred's name. Yeah, they. I mean, what they talk about Conrad isn't much. They don't bring up Conrad much after this, except to sort of like down talk him and talk about why he sucked. <laughs> Yeah. And poor Conrad. Do you think there's a hidden meaning to that? Well, I, I just looked at it as a re it would being enforced. I looked at it as the idea being reinforced, reinforced. I mean, look at King Henry the eighth and his one heir was it Edward who was so sickly and everybody worried that he was going to die all the time and that he couldn't couldn't possibly carry on the um, the kingdom. And I kind of look at it as that. If you're not this strong, uh, healthy man doing very manly things, there's really no way that you're going to be able to hold and carry on the kingdom. So you're not a worthy heir. And so what happens to the, the character that's not going to be a worthy heir? He instantly dies <laughs> in a brutal manner. Yeah. I just felt like it, that was a reinforced... A moment for me of of that kind of medieval and even lasting longer that mindset of the heir and those those strong heirs that have to carry on the kingdom for their for their fathers it's just kind of a strange um when when i was thinking about this and reading it i was thinking about how in the past we had this phenomenon of sickly children and kind of for lack of a better term the runts of the litter mm. and at that point, you know, medicine has advanced so far in our day and age that when when a family has a child that is sickly and we all feel like really we all rally around them and support them and do a Caring Bridge website and, you know, a GoFundMe or something like that. And everyone prays for them. But back in the time, it was like, well, he was a sickly child, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, like <laughs> he spent a a month or two in bed with smallpox. Oh, geez. Or so, you know, it, it's what just, a loser. It's it's a really strange phenomenon where where life is is so cherished nowadays that well, and yeah, medicine can help sickly right. people. You know, medicine has gone so far that the mortality rates for infants and mothers in labor has just changed dramatically. I was thinking I would bring up that that piece that I had highlighted. And it's a little further in. It's page 28. So there's, what, 104 pages on my Kindle, it said. I don't know. I don't have a physical version. It's going to be hard to exactly spot sight. However, Bianca is Isabella's domestic or her damsel, which is basically a lady in waiting, one of her closest confidants and the person that takes care of her. And Bianca... And Isabella are speaking about what's going to happen further on in the story with Manfred and Hippolyta. And Isabella says, It wounds my soul when I am witness to his causeless severity towards her. Oh, madam, said Bianca, all men use their wives so when they are weary of them. And then there's another statement a little later talking about how that is what wives are are for is to support their husbands. And I just thought, again, like, what a different time. <laughs> well, do you think that that was maybe a critique of the state of affairs is that it was kind of a tongue in cheek? Because like one thing about this story is that it's definitely a comedy. I see it as a comedy. It is. I would think so. I just, I mean, even if it is, it's putting light on something that he didn't agree with. It still shows that it was like a very common mindset that, you know, mistresses and and being able to put aside your wife for whatever reason when you're bored of her. I just found that to be really interesting, that little section there. That does really touch, though, on what gothic fiction seems to be uh, a vehicle for at the time, which is criticizing these certain things that are going on in society. And that's kind of what like this, this piece I was reading in the Cambridge companion talks about is, is confronting certain things about society that, that really don't make sense. And one major theme of Gothic works is that there's this disconnect and this logical inconsistency. Are people trying to 
shed the tradition of the past, but at the same time being afraid of the chaos of the future that that will bring. And so this comment on gender roles and, you know, we, we've kind of, um, we've complained a little bit about the, the Marxist analysis of everything being because you're a member of a certain group, but at the same time confronting that expectation of society commenting on and criticizing the certain gender roles of the time, but yet being afraid of what the future holds. Mm. There's that disconnect there. Yeah, this is a good example of that. So I suppose maybe we should go a little bit further, not full out lay a synopsis out there, but okay. So there's this family. Yeah. Well, I, I'm hoping that people will have read the book. It, it's not, I know, but if not, yeah. Okay. So there's this family And we laid that out. They're in an Italian castle. They're nobility. Conrad gets crushed, literally. And pretty cool. (laughs) And then from there, you know, there was supposed to be this wedding between Isabella and Conrad. Conrad's dead. He's just squashed like a bug. Squashed with his giant helmet. And so once, you know, they've kind of ran around figuring out this helmet thing, this part that I also found to be so. I think Manfred has the only actual character arc in the entire book. Yeah, it was kind of devoid of that character development that we've come to like. I I would argue that Manfred's like the main character. And I would say, you know, in this section, after his only his only son and heir has died and he goes to his chambers to mourn his son He decides in this moment that the only way that he can care, like, secure his kingdom and carry on his line is to marry Isabella himself. But But he's already married. But but it's also because of this prophecy. There's a prophecy that the end of his line will come at a certain point in time. Do you remember? Do you recall this at all? Oh, right. Yeah. And, And so in contemplating this prophecy, but also the end of his line in that Conrad has been snuffed out (laughs) violently that he needs to take it upon himself to further his line. He basically comes up with a way to divorce Hippolyta, his wife, who is just a very sweet rubber stamp. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She's just a massive pushover during this whole thing. Just kind of like a paper cutout of a devoted wife. Eh, I mean, I like her character, but Meh. And a, a lot of the ways she's supposed to be an archetype of the time, just kind of this doting wife that just goes along with everything. Yeah, I can definitely see that. You know, and then there's the daughter, Matilda and Isabella, who grew up like sisters and who are very, very close. And then Hippolyta is sort of this comes in as the, you know, the other point, sort of this triangle between this womanly love and friendship and support that they all have between the three of them. And there's a few different scenes of their, you know, mutual love and respect for each other and how they, you know, will deal with the outside forces and these events that are happening to them and kind of talk about how they support each other and love each other and that they're going to be there for each other. And I think that's one of the parts that I did like about it is I mean, when do you see that? What's that thing called the the thing for movies and books where there's not women in a room interacting with each other if there's not a man there? Oh, I it was some kind of a something we talked about in undergrad where there was this big study done where they analyzed they analyzed this whole swath of films and they determined that there was I don't know, there wasn't any women interaction that didn't involve a man. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Oh, gosh, I wish we could remember what it was called. If we find it, we'll link it in the show notes page. But but. the the whole point was that women are never in a scene or having these interactions without a man there. And so, I mean, not trying to be all bleh, but it's really nice to have women in a book or movie or whatever just meeting each other and supporting each other and dealing with what comes instead of turning it into something else. Was that because it's more realistic to you? Yes and no. I would say that there have been members and people in my life that as women have just sort of 
clung to each other in the midst of outside forces and supported each other during those things. And then there's been moments with with which the women in my life have made it difficult to to deal with other things that are happening. And so I just enjoy it because it's something I like. I I enjoy holding and lifting people up, especially when I see them and I can relate to them. I can empathize and I can put myself in their shoes. So I like that and I enjoy those parts. Maybe not as exciting as other parts, but especially that a that a man wrote them. I thought that those parts were nice. Well, did do you feel the need to be represented in in media? And I, I'm saying this because I want to understand, not as some kind of a. Well, I think that that so many times, like nice women in media are like that rubber stamp thing you were talking about. They're they're bland and blasé and they're not interesting or dynamic because people want that drama and they want something to be escapism perhaps. But I find that to me, it's actually nice to see it represented because I just feel like you don't. And I feel that I am a nice person generally. If you are mean to me, you'll find out that I can't be nice. I won't be nice, <laughs> but I think generally I'm a nice person. And I think that seeing nice people being nice for no other reason than just being nice is nice. <laughs> it makes sense. I mean, when we're talking about these characters in terms of, and this is something I had made a note on in the manuscript as I was reading is that we're doing all this analysis of characters based on their sex or their political position or, the, or excuse me, their economic position. But what I thought was really lacking is this analysis of who is Matilda as an individual, for example. Oh, yeah. Or, there was like nothing. There was like nothing yeah. of that. And there, you can't really pick out except for Manfred. Um, but there's not really a lot of other individuality or um, – character depth in these characters they're sort of just these like paper cutouts like holding place as manfred or whoever else is uh, you know in stage light um uh you know center stage so to speak doing the speaking or whatever well i wanted i wanted to try and like postulate on that though because what why is it that and this is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but why is it that Matilda is so vindictive of this arranged – or she so tries to save Theodore, who is the peasant who rescues Isabella, basically, and interjects himself. And he – I thought that he was the real hero of the story and the main character, perhaps, in that Manfred is the um, the the villain. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking that, well, Matilda, as an individual, has probably grown up her whole life watching her, her mother be a rubber stamp and being just this doormat. And she has probably become – I don't want to keep using the word vindictive, but uh, I don't think vindictive. a little bit rebellious. I don't think – yeah, I don't think vindictive is the right word. I think that she sort of gets more of a backbone – that she sees that, you know, there's a scene where Theodore is introduced. Now Theodore is a young peasant that is the first to notice that the giant helmet <laughs> is actually the exact same helmet that was on the statue of Alfonso, who was the like person that settled Otranto and was like the first king, I think. And he notices that the statue in the church had a helmet. It looked exactly like this giant helmet. That helmet is gone and is now massive and it is now crushing Conrad. So Theodore's this first person that notices this. He brings it to the attention of Manfred or his domestics, his uh, servants. And Manfred instantly freaks out and decides that theater, Theodore who at that time is just called young peasant needs to be locked up and that he must have done some sort of magic or something to make this happen and to kill Conrad. So he locks him up and he's basically going to kill him and execute him. And in the first uh, little bit, he Theodore escapes 
and he's underground and he helps Isabella run away from Manfred when Manfred calls Isabella into his chamber after he comes on to her <laughs> after he's decided that they're going to get married and he basically is like doing this like come hither speech to her and she's like no and she just runs from the chamber finds this passageway the secret passageway which is another part of which like was, that gothic yeah the secret passage which was ways. illuminated by a bolt of moonlight which is just yes. totally gothic what we talked about in episode one yes you're in this huge castle you're like okay sidebar walpole he built a giant gothic castle and he lived in it and it was called strawberry hill house <laughs> strawberry hill <laughs> and this made me think of shirley jackson's the haunting of hill house and i wondered if that was a nod to walpole possibly but anyway this is amazing like they're in a castle this like moonbeam shines upon the secret passageway she like runs into it gets away from him and who does she discover in the bowels of the castle but the young peasant and you think that this is going to be some brown chicken like moment but no he's this honorable like gentleman yeah kind of lancelot type and he helps her get away and he gets caught in the meantime and in that moment you know, Manfred's decided, I'm taking him out. I'm going to kill him. And Matilda comes and sees this happening. And she decides that she's going to sort of stand up to it in the moment. Anyway, I found that she does grow a little bit of a backbone in these few. There's a few sections of it that where she sort of stands up a little bit to it. But she's she's also an interesting character. But I just don't feel like she has the whole width and depth that some of the other characters do what do you think is the decision that isabella makes to run away from manfred because it seems like she's resigned to her fate to marry conrad and she mentions that in the come hither speech well first off manfred's raised her from a child and she's been basically groomed into thinking that she's going to marry conrad and it's a supposed good match. And it seems that it is her duty to do so. But now this married older man who's been raising her as his own child pops up and is like, hey, give me sons. So I think that's why she ran away, because she thinks of him in like a father role. And not only that, she was going to marry his son. So I think there's sort of some multi-level gross happening there. Yeah, well, fair enough. And I I guess what my real question is, is is that a character progression there? Is she departing from her past character? I suppose in a little bit she is. And I think Isabella is kind of the sassier one between her and Matilda. I think Isabella's a little bit more willing to take the route of not being the good girl, so to speak. And she decides she's going to run away and she's going to deny him and disobey. And so it's not, I mean, it's two levels. So it's not only her disobeying her father figure, it's her denying a suitor. So, She's not so it is a huge detraction from the character of this dutiful princess who's going to marry Conrad, even though she's not interested in him whatsoever. And she repeats that she's not interested in him whatsoever multiple times. But she she decides that she's going to run away and she does so. And I think that, I mean, it's an interesting departure from the archetype of that princess that's going to do what she's supposed to do. So it this is, I mean, 104 pages isn't really that long. And when you talk about some stories and some characters that go on for hundreds of pages, helping you understand who the character is, when you really get into these 104 pages and you even look at sentences, you can see that there is, is more to it than 
what meets the eye. I found this to be an incredibly enjoyable read. At first, the prose is a bit, it takes a bit to warm up to it because it's very. I, by modern standards, and I I don't know, I, I study, my focus was creative writing. So looking at this, I would have said that this is terrible writing because all it is is really narration for the for a lot of it for the beginning of it because you you don't there's a lot of showing and not telling right. if you know what i mean i before i lose what my comment on what you just said is that i really enjoy the art of the short story more than i do the novel because oh. one thing we kind of learned about is how it forces more to happen in less space and it's more of a challenge so each sentence has more meaning when you take it that way. Definitely. And it's, I, you know, when I first realized that we were needing to read this again and looking back on when I read it, when I was an undergrad, I was kind of like, eh. <laughs> well, when you read something for pleasure, it's a lot better than because. So for instance, when we read Fahrenheit 451 in high school, I hated it because I had to. Mm. And maybe that's just my personality type is, is, is that I'm not vindictive. Maybe I am vindictive. You tell me. You're married to me. <laughs> I don't want to do this on the air. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Well. No, but you're – you – so I'm a little bit this way too. It's anti – I don't – I guess I would say I'm a little bit anti-authority. I don't like – when I'm being told to do something. Oh, we got a little punk rocker here. Mm, you know me. So I suppose that's part of the reason why I was not dreading, but I was looking upon it a bit more as a chore. And, you know, once I read the last, and I actually finished it this evening again, and I was uh, reading the last few sentences, and it it ties up real quick, by the way. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> It's a bit abrupt. Within like three pages. <laughs> but um, I found myself wishing that there was a bit more to it. and But at um, the same time, it drags a little bit, don't you? There's a couple moments where it does. But I would say this is the part that I kind of wanted to bring up additionally. Was that the spooky bits. The spooky bits. <laughs> <laughs> were just so abrupt that you almost had to reread it to realize that it was like a ghost or it was something scary happening. Um, for example, there is a moment where Bianca, again, a uh, reminder, the damsel or the lady in waiting, uh, sees a giant hand or a giant foot but she she basically sees a ghostly apparition that's gigantic and she runs into the room and is exclaiming about it. But it's in such a way that as I was reading, I kind of had to pause and sort of wait what she's scared of, what's happening. <laughs> it just and I don't know if it's the narration versus the description but it took me a minute to figure out that she was talking about a ghost. And I think that's one thing that I would say I did not enjoy. I like the buildup. I like the setting of the stage. I like to read something and be afraid of it. And there was really nothing that scared, was scary in this. There were a couple moments where there were paintings talking and there were a couple ghosts, and then there was the giant sword, giant helmet, giant things, bits, pieces uh, that were be being seen or happening around the castle. But it, it wasn't frightening, and I was a little bit let down there because I kind of was waiting for, you know, I read Dracula, and I was, there were points where I was, scared and the wall climbing <laughs> that was that's exactly yeah. what i was thinking of. really that's exactly what i was thinking of so there were moments of of being scared when i was reading it and i just didn't get those in this and i don't know if it's 
the whole comet comedic aspect of it. You, you, I know that you had something else about the the ghosts that you brought up to me the other day that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, just to touch on what you just said, I I loved it. I loved the the because it's all spoopy to me. And will you define spoopy? Because <laughs> we so we we've been listening to uh, the, scared, the scared to death scared to death podcast, and uh, we've really enjoyed that, and and we've wanted to do something like that. It's kind of what I don't know inspired me to do this show really, but what is spoopy? Spoopy is like a slang cute, term. Cute and spooky. Okay, so maybe this isn't, but I so that's, cute and spooky. That's what Urban Dictionary says. And well, gosh, I trust that Urban Dictionary. Oh well, well, you should. Hand over heart. Well, okay, so it, it's not this. The story isn't spoopy. It's just it's it's. Entertaining and funny and scary in the same way that the Evil Dead is, um, and it, it's not particularly. Dude, the Evil Dead campy. super scared me. No, no, but I mean like the Evil Dead too, and, and oh. Army of Darkness and Army stuff. of Darkness. That was the first one yeah. I ever saw, and while it was kind of scary, I found myself laughing. So same, yeah, I same would with say this. I would say I could see that, but it. It's it's so absurd. The whole story is so absurd. And I remember the moment when I when it clicked and I really got it was this conversation. So there's some spooky stuff happening. Well, I mean, even with the helmet fall, this giant helmet falling like it's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just. Yeah. And and then all this this kind of spooky stuff happens. But this giant coat of arms or, you know, this giant knight in armor and this a sword and, and portraits talking, it's just blatantly on its face kind of comedic. Absolutely. And there's this conversation with uh, Manfred when he comes downstairs in the in the bowels of the castle and the servants come up to him and he's asking Diego, Diego and Jacques. <laughs> He, they're, they're like, D- D- okay, boss, right. you know, like that kind of, and he's like, for God's sake, will you just like, yeah, will you just tell me where she is? And it takes like a whole page or two it's for them to spit out. Well, 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 Jacques said, oh, well, or uh, Diego said. It's wonderful. And then it is sort of echoed a little later with Bianca, Manfred Lake. I guess bribes her with a ring and says, I'll give you another jewel or another ring if you spy on Isabella and tell her, tell me what she's up to with Theodore and whether they're like having secret romantic moments. So then Bianca comes back and she's, this is the same thing I was talking about earlier. So she comes back to him to report that she, you know, saw this giant ghostly image and she's saying she can barely spit it out and he's like get to the point and she's like oh my lord oh my dear oh and she can't she can't get to the point and he just keeps saying like come on woman <laughs> you <laughs> well what what's another exa- another example of this too is like uh with manfred's melodramatic speeches he he's like i will follow thee to the depths of perdition yes like, this is just amazing. Like, I've been waiting to. There was something he said in there about, I can't even remember. There's just some of his insults are prime. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're Block, prime. He's calling people blockheads. And I was like, that's a very modern sounding insult. Right. For some reason. Yeah. He says something about you audacious fool or something <laughs> like that. And I was like, I can't wait for the moment that something comes up and I'm like, you audacious fool. Yeah. Well, let's let's circle back around. Unless did you have something just now? Oh, I always have something. <laughs> well, let's circle around to the nature of the the gothic and the gothic terror happening here. He, this is from the Cambridge Guide as well. It says our objectives here are to explain the reasons for the persistence of the gothic across modern history and how and why so many changes and variations have occurred in this curious mode over two hundred and fifty years. One difficulty in doing so, of course, is how pliable and malleable this type of fiction making has proven to be, stemming as it does from an uneasy conflation of genres, styles, and conflicted cultural concerns from its outset. Nevertheless, given how relatively 
constant some of its features are. We can specify some general parameters by which fictions can be identified as primarily or substantially gothic. And this really touches on what we talked about in episode one, but I think it's useful to frame here since this is, you know, the first gothic piece. Mm. But though not always as obviously as in the castle of Otranto or Dracula, a gothic tale usually takes place at least some of the time in an antiquated or seemingly antiquated space, be it a castle, a foreign palace, an abbey, a vast prison, a subterranean crypt, a graveyard, a primeval frontier or island, a large old house or theater, an aging city or urban underworld, a decaying storehouse, factory, laboratory, public building, or some new recreation recreation of an older venue, such as an office with old filing cabinets, an overworked spaceship, or a computer memory. Within this space, or a combination of such spaces, are hidden some secrets from the past, sometimes the recent past, that haunt the characters psychologically, physically, or otherwise at the main time of the story. These hauntings can take many forms, but they frequently assume the features of ghosts, specters, or monsters, or giant suits of armor, (laughs) mixing features from different realms of being, often life and death, that rise from within the antiquated space, or sometimes invade it from alien realms to manifest unresolved crimes or conflicts that can no longer be successfully buried from view. It is at this level that gothic fictions generally play with and oscillate between the early lo- earthly laws of conventional reality and the possibilities of the supernatural. At least somewhat, as Walpole urged such stories to do, often siding with one of these over the other in the end, but usually raising the possibility that the boundaries between these may have been crossed, at least psychologically, but also physically or both. This oscillation can range across a continuum between what have come to be called the terror gothic on the one hand and the horror gothic on the other the first the terror gothic holds characters and readers mostly in anxious suspense about threats to life safety and sanity kept largely out of sight or in shadows or suggestions from a hidden past while the latter the horror gothic confronts the principal characters with the gross violence of physical or psychological dissolution, explicitly shattering the assumed norms, including the rep- repressions of everyday life with wildly shocking and even revolting consequences. So I think that, that the Castle of Otranto is an example of the horror gothic. The oh, second. absolutely. With, with it, it kicks off with the crushing mm-hmm. <laughs> and continues with physical manifestations. Definitely. What oh, is interesting. What what is the the dead hand of the past coming through the present in the castle of Otranto? I think it's the specter of this um Alfonso. Alfonso. I would yeah, you can definitely see that. I think so not only he appears but also the monk, not the monk. Yes, the monk who so Frederick is Isabella's father who sort of sneaky he's not the monk but no, Fred, yeah sorry no but i wanted to clarify okay so there's a section where all of a sudden these knights appear and they're they've got all of this army with them and they have the gigantic sword that matches the helmet and there's three knights and the one heading them um, is eventually revealed to be Frederick, who is Isabella's long lost father. And he comes back from the Crusades, the right? Crusades, and, you know, frees himself from whatever because of this dream he has where he's told to go to a place and dig and he does and it's a gigantic sword and on the sword it has a passage um which he interprets to be that he's got to go save isabella and so there's a moment where he gets really caught up because he's into matilda who must just be like stunning because everybody wants to marry her frederick wants to marry her and theodore wants to marry her And so 
he gets kind of distracted wanting to marry her. And then he realizes the whole reason why he came back to and and did all of this was to save Isabella. And so he gets visited by the ghost at the very it's almost at the very end. And so that would be another example of of the past coming back not once but twice for the character. Oh, interesting. So, well, we we have that that instance, but also the Alfonso. prophecy from the past. Oh, the uh, prophecy coming coming back for Manfred and mm-hmm. for his line. And what I'm thinking here is that so, in, in the timeline of the story, I think we've only gotten to like chapter two or three, and so we're going to break this into two parts because there's so much more to talk about here. Sure. Um, but I want to keep this under an hour and 15 minutes for this part. What has happened in the plot so far? We've left off where Isabella retreats from Manfred's advances. She goes to the basement. She escapes. The peasant Theodore is in the basement. And there's there's talk. There's accusations. Manfred kind of confronts him. <laughs> yeah, Isabella escapes, but Theodore, the young peasant, does not. He gets caught by Manfred and his domestics. And they bring him up for judgment. Is the peasant Theodore, was he already trapped under the... Well, he escaped from... So he was in a room imprisoned and he somehow escapes and gets down into the bowels of the castle and there's a trap door. And Isabella knows of the trap door. So she runs down there to get through the trapdoor. The trapdoor leads directly to the church, which she goes to and claims sanctuary. And Father Jerome basically holds her, helps hide her there. Okay. And to get through the plot, at least through the second chapter, uh, isn't the second chapter where Father Jerome comes to plead? Uh, with Manfred, or Manfred summons Father Jerome. Manfred, yeah, he summons Father Jerome because he wants to divorce his wife so that he can marry Isabella. So he basically calls ma- f- calls Father Manfred forward so that they can... Father Jerome. Oh, Manfred calls <laughs> Father Jerome forward uh, from the church so that he can get him, A, to get Isabella out of there, because, you know, there's a bunch of spying happening. So he figures out Isabel is there and find a way to be divorced from his wife and get the support of this clergyman. And he comes, Manfred comes up with this crazy argument as to why his marriage to Hippolyta is illegitimate. Somehow right? they're related. That they're related somehow. And that is it that she knew about it and married him anyways or something? S- something. Some aqu- kind of a. Convoluted. Yeah. And but so at at the same time that Father Jerome is there talking to Manfred, he realizes that Theodore is like his long lost son. Yeah. So at some point in the past, before Father Jerome was Father Jerome, he was a count and he will find out a little later, but he's some sort of some sort of royalty and he. They had this, he and whoever had this son, and he went, decided to, you know, take up the cloth and left his son with the woman, the mother, and then somehow figure this, figures it out in this moment. And I can't remember how it's they figured it out. It's some tattoo on his shoulder, on oh. Theodore's shoulder, which it reminds me of Dwight from The Office where he's like, now... When when your son is born, mark him in a spot where only you know. So you know that they don't switch him out at birth. <laughs> in a way that only you can like <laughs> write it. So we we like the office a lot. So so that's kind of where maybe we should leave off. So in, in at least in the plot, uh Jerome starts he starts begging for Theodore's life even before he knows that Theodore is mm-hmm. his son. But after that happens, then this is when Frederick shows up and wants Isabella back. And Frederick and Manfred start talking about, am I right in the in the timeline here, is that Frederick and Manfred start talking about a way that they should exchange daughters? <laughs> well, first, Isabella runs away away. So she's she was she did run from 
the castle to the church. And then she runs from the church to the forest and ends up in a cave. Right. And Theodore goes out there. And this is a point where Isabella decides that she loves or she's in love with Theodore, I think, is the point where I think it's this point. She decides that. Where they meet in the caves. And they meet in the cave. Okay. Yeah. And he says, you know, I will. She thinks that he, she, he's someone from the castle that was sent to track her down and take her back. And he's like, no, I am I will defend you with my life. And she's like, wow, that's super hot. And. And they do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, we'll leave it off there so we have enough to talk about in the next episode. And I, I think I want to talk about more of these gothic elements, but I want also want to talk about whether we think Manfred is uncanny or if there's inhuman aspects to him. Okay. okay. Um, and I, I think there's a lot more to dissect here and we'll get a bit more into the Cambridge companion because there's lots of little nuggets also in there. And then I wanted to bring up the soap opera aspects of this and how, you know, just looking at it in a modern point of view, how this is just so over the top. Yeah. And I, you know, I was waiting for, you know, someone's long lost brother who died in a fire to, to like, come back. Come to back. Life. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, we appreciate any support and interest you have for, you know, our little rambles here. If you have anything that you would like to contribute or ask us to speak about or enter into some sort of dialogue or even argument with us, we would enjoy it. And please email us at unhallowedpodcast at gmail.com. I'm so glad that I have you here doing this with me. Um, there's so much that I've already even forgotten about the story or things that you've added. So I love you, honey. And this has been a lot of fun. I've been looking forward to doing this with you. Thanks, Patty Millet. <laughs> Check us out at unhallowedpodcast.com. There's a bunch of social media badges there. We'll be posting this on Goodreads as well. Uh, but follow us. We have Instagram, Twitter, uh, forward slash unhallowed pod, P O D. Let's see. You can support us on Patreon. We're, we're trying to think up a bunch of tiers and benefits that we can offer. If you have any, any ideas, email us some ideas for for rewards that you'd like to have. We also have, if you go to unhallowedpodcast.com forward slash support, we have cryptocurrency addresses. We have PayPal. You can also purchase a bunch of the things we've been talking about on Amazon through our Amazon affiliate links. That, that'd be at unhallowedpodcast.com forward slash Amazon. Just do all your regular shopping there. And please, most, most importantly, is to give us a rating and review on iTunes. That would be super duper. We'd really <laughs> appreciate that. Comment and share. Share it to a friend if you've enjoyed this. But yeah, we're really excited. Uh, we're excited to get back into part two, and I think that will wrap up our coverage of the Castle of Otranto. So thanks again for joining us, and uh, take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.